Uh, well, you can go ahead and share your screen. Uh, Eran and myself will be moderating this session today. So please uh, take it on. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. So this is a joint work with uh, Mary Mello and uh, I will present together with uh, Nicola. Um, so first, the first part of the talk will be about what is NACPAC, what is doing, and then uh, where it is useful uh, and uh, how, like the implementation details. So um, I'll start with the uh, briefly description. We have many, many snacks in many applications. So they are bulky, they are, uh, they are hard to verify. Uh, we construct this snark pack, which is a scheme that allows us to aggregate together many snarks in a shorter logarithmic uh, size snark that can be verified also with less overhead than doing it individually. So that's our contribution uh, and we do it in practice. So we have an implementation for this. Um, so what SNARK are we focusing on? We, uh, we, are, we are aggregating ROT16 SNARKs. This looks the, in the following way. We have a common reference string, which is a structure reference string uh, of some encodings of powers of some secret, secret S, let's say, and the polynomials evaluated in that in that S. And then the, the proof is um, constant side, it has three group elements, um, A, B, and C. And the verification equation, this is a simplified verification. It doesn't look exactly like that, but this is the, the essential part we, uh, we have to keep in mind. We are doing a pairing check on these uh, proof elements, A, B, and C, with some constant B, which is part of the verification key. Okay, so having this structure in mind, let's see how it works when we have many of those. So we have many snarks, we have a bunch of, uh, uh, of AIs, BIs, and CIs, so three vectors here, and we want to verify them. So we have to apply, like naively, we will apply this verification check uh, n times for each of them. Of course, this is costly. Can we do it better? And the answer is yes, there is a smarter way to do it by batching together this verification. So what's the verifying able to, to do? Just sample a randomness or many randomness, but let's say one and um, compute a um, linear combination, a random linear combination of all these n check, checks. And this will uh, result in a single check at the end. Uh, and because this is, a, is random and independent of the, of the proving elements, then with, with overwhelming probability, this check holding ensures that all the independent che checks would have hold. So this still, still asks some work from the verifier. And of course, the verifier should read all the, all the vectors, of, all, all the vector of proofs. Uh, so we will we'll like to do better than this. So let's remark something about uh, like here is the, the bilinear group operation, the pairing one and how it works. Um, I simplified it in presenting it in the symmetric setting. So what's, what's remarkable here is that we can in this randomized linear combination of pairing checks, we can just, uh, this is associative, so we can just put the, the powers, the random powers inside the pairing. So we will result in something of this kind. And what if the, the prover or an aggregator just takes the different proofs and computes on its side uh, this, this uh, left-hand term here from its proving, uh, proving elements and uh, the value here that's, that depends on the proof elements. So uh, we will call this ZAB for the product of pairings of uh, different uh, vectors, AI and BIs from the proof and ZC, uh, this product of CI exponentiated at uh, randomness uh, R to the I. So if, if the prover computes this and send it to the verifier, then the verifier has a, a lot less job to do, just compute a final uh, pairing for n proofs. But there is, there is a catch here, right? Yeah. 
Sorry, I have a short question. Yes. I missed, what was D again? D is part, it's a constant. It's in all the pairing checks. It's, it's something public, let's say. Uh -huh. it, it, it is there because it's part of the verifier key. Okay. okay. So we can ignore it. I put it there to make it look a little more closer to the reality. Yeah, so what the verifier will, will uh, need to check is this ZAB, which it receives from the prover, equals a uh, paired of the ZC with this value D, which is fixed, which is the same. Okay, uh, but the, the problem is that the verifier has to trust that these values, ZAB and ZC, are uh, in, indeed consistent with the proof elements, with the N proofs, initial proofs that we have. So what is left to do is to convince that starting from vectors A, B, and C, computing this kind of values, Z, A, B, and C, um, is correct with respect to, to some commitment to the initial vectors, for example. So this part here of the aggregation is the, where we have to work a little bit. Uh, so let's see what we use in order to, to solve this. So the, the main tool is um, are actually the proofs for inner uh, pairing products uh, by uh, Benedict, Mary, and all. Um, and uh, those are actually proving that for a group, a source group element A and some scalar vector B, like some field elements B, we have this uh, multi exponentiation and this we will call MIP, like a multi inner product uh, proof. And the second one proves some relation of this kind, which we'll call target inner uh, pairing product. Um, and this is done starting from commitments to the initial vectors A and B to be proven. Okay, so if we stare a little bit at these relations and what we needed for our aggregation, um, so we needed this ZC that looks like some vector from the proof to some randomness vector, which are uh, field elements, and ZAB, which is uh, like the pairing of vectors from the proof with respect to the same randomness. So we just have to write them in the notation from MIP and PIP, uh, and TIP, like inner uh, pairing products. So it feels like ZC fits exactly what MIP is enabling us to prove, and ZAB fits exactly what TIP enable us to prove. So we have the perfect ingredients to construct our aggregation. Uh, we will plug the exact values we need here to prove C and I for the MIP and A and B to the I for the TIP and it should be fine. This should solve all our problems. Uh, what's the blocking point? Why we don't do it directly? Uh, it's because like this MIP and TIP schemes um, ask us to commit to, to our vectors first, to commit to C, commit to A and B, and then uh, enable these proofs. And the commitment schemes require some commitment keys that are generated during a trusted setup. Tadam, so we have the trusted setup problem we discussed earlier this week. Practitioners are not really trusted setup friendly because they, this trusted setup needs ceremonies. Um, they require a lot of resources like uh, computationally, human efforts, and the organization in general. So, and trust, which is the, the harder to get, I think. So we want to avoid trusted setups. So our goal was to reuse as much as possible existing uh, structure reference strings and, the, and to reorganize the scheme and to redesign the scheme such that this, uh, this works with what trusted setup we have already there. So what we use actually, we, um, uh, we will um, have the powers of tau ceremonies from uh, two different systems, from Filecoin and from Zcash, and use those to, to construct our commitment schemes. So um, this also will change, will, We'll have, to, we'll have to adapt TIP and MIP proofs that I presented before in order to work with this commitment scheme. So there are many details to, uh, to, to change in the scheme, but finally we, we, can, uh, we can use those with a little loss in, uh, in efficiency. So what we are doing, we are taking the, the vectors from the proofs 
and we act, we commit to them with the new commitment schemes, which uh, has constant size of two target group elements. Hopefully we can commit together A and B vectors in a single commitment. So the only overhead compared with the um, uh, original work uh, from Benedict and all, uh, it's just one, one target group element on the commitment side. And then we adapt MIP and TIP proofs for these inner pairing products that we needed in aggregation in order to work with our commitments. And we also change little details in order to have optimizations for the implementation. And this is a log n overhead to prove that ZC, the value ZC and ZAB are, uh, are uh, the inner uh, pairing products for the initial committed values A, B, and C, which are the proof elements. So actually this is our snark pack and to see what the verification looks like now for the whole bunch of n proofs, we will receive only log n commitments um, and we will run MIP and TIP together in an efficient way that requires uh, an overhead of log n for the verifier instead of n of uh, checking all the proofs individually. And then of course we have to check the final GROD16 equation, which is this uh, uh, ZAB, which we received and ZC uh, paired with D. So that's that's all for my side. And now uh, I leave the stage to Nicolas to present uh, where we use this and how it works exactly in the implementation. Thanks, Inka. Um, I will I will share. Yeah, now I will share. I will make my own. Sure, sure, sure. I need to unshare then. Oh, sorry. I'm I'm. Are you spoiling? I'm very clumsy. Okay, okay, okay. I, I will be there. No worries. <laughs> okay, I got it. Sorry. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, um, I'm, I'm gonna quickly talk about where we use this, um, this scheme and then I'm going to the benchmark and implementation section. So um, for those who, know, who don't know what Filecoin is, I'm going to keep it short in one sentence. You can think of Filecoin as a proof of stake blockchain where the stake is a storage you dedicate to the uh, network. Um, for sake of time, that's only the only thing I'm going to say about Filecoin. Um, so miners have to um, um, create a proof that they correctly reserve 32 gigabytes of um, data on chain, and we call this proof proof commits. And because this uh, this is we are proving things about 32 gigabyte sectors, uh, then we need actually 10 snark because it's it's a huge, uh, really huge proof. I'm not going into details, but basically that's how it works. So as a miner. I create a proof commits for 32 gigabyte sectors and I submit it on chain, then my stake increase of uh, 32 gigabytes. So many miners are going to um, create this proof at the same time and they're going to submit on chain at each block. Okay, so we are on proof of storage um, chain. Um, what is the problem here is that the parameters block is finite. So I cannot put as many proof commits as I want in a, in a block, of course. As uh, Dig or Friedel mentioned before, we are offering around 6 million snark per day. So it's really a lot and our blocks are full and we have even five blocks per epoch. Um, so uh, we need a way to onboard more storage uh, by keeping the same number of blocks. And why do we cannot put more proof commits on chain? Um, <clears throat> it's because uh, time or gas is finite. So um, each, uh, each block needs to be verified by the whole network, by all miners. So they will verify each uh, proof commit individually. Remember it's 10 snaps. So we are using some tricks here to uh, improve the verification time, but still we will verify uh, all proof commits. And then uh, if there are uh, too many, then the, the last proof commit will not be included in the, in the block because uh, then it costs too much with, with, with the gas. Um, so, what can we do? We can do uh, an, uh, what what is Filecoin is actually doing now is using batch verification. Um, so as um, as Anka mentioned previously, so we just uh, take all these proofs together and batch verify. So we gain a lot of efficiency there. So we can put more proof commits on chain already. Uh, but if we want to go uh, um, 
if we want to go further, uh, then we, we actually need the snap pack. And this is where we're going to um, use our solution here as where we're going to have uh, one miner that is going to create a mini proof commit and then create one aggregated proof. It's going to embed this one in the block. And then uh, the, the whole chain is going to verify only aggregated proof and not individual proof commits. Um, so that's just for giving you a context of where we, we use um, uh, snark park for for five one and as a rough benchmark we're going to start slowly uh, but we are going to allow miners to uh, post 200 um, more uh, to create aggregated proof of 200 proof commits that's roughly 2000 snarks uh, at the beginning and then we'll increase if we see that the network can sustain this load um, so now about the implementation, uh, it's a library called in Rust. It's available at the Bell person, so which is a Bellman fork that we use in Filecoin. Um, it's, uh, the code is already derived from the Arcfork library, uh, which implement the original paper from Brutz and Al. And uh, it's using the GLS 12 3 at one curves from the BLAST library, um, which is um, basically a, a assembly library, which makes it operation very fast. Um, as Enka said, we are combining the, the CRS from Filecoin and Zcash. Uh, we are up, allowing up to 200 to the power of 19 uh, proof aggregation, but anyway, in, in practice, we'll never go that far. And uh, we have done the benchmark that I'm going to show you on the 60 threads and 32 proofs. It's, it's been audited once and it's going to be audited a second time currently. Uh, on one of the slides before, it looked as though there were four different generators that you needed. Uh, oh, sorry, four different um, toxic waste values. Um, how do you get that from just two setups? No, we only need the G to the G to the alpha, H to alpha from one CRS. Oh, right. And, okay. and so G to secrets. beta and H to beta. Yes, yeah, just two two different generators. Yeah. Got it. Um, Thanks. And so this is a verify item that we get in the end. Uh, so uh, as a just a number that I, we can we have put in the paper is like we can verify 8,000 proof in 33 milliseconds, which is gives a ratio of uh, 0.004 millisecond per proof. Uh, this is including unsterilization as well, because this is uh, usually what, um, what interests us in the blockchain settings. Uh, the implementation relies heavily on parallelism. Um, we have, uh, also made some over optimization like we have NIP and TIP combined. Um, so we have, I think there I'm hearing an echo from your mic, can you? Oh, sorry. Great. Um, we have combined uh, MIP and TIP and we're also doing randomized pairing checks in the end. So we only do one final exponentiation uh, because there's quite a lot of pairing checks actually like around 14. Um, so we have a bunch of uh, optimization and implementation that give us this, uh, this verification type here. And we can see that if you simply verify using batch verification, then you're still better off uh, as long as you verify less than 32 proof. Uh, if you start verifying more, then you 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 better maybe um, uh, using this scheme. As of the proof size, then um, if you simply using batch verification, then you need to uh, get all the proof uh, separately. So this is linear, and uh, aggregation becomes uh, smaller as uh, 128 proof here. And we are using compression of uh, GT elements uh, based on tourist compression, which is like uh, derived from the implementation on the Relic library. Um, and of the aggregation time, uh, we can uh, quickly aggregate 8,000 proof on around uh, less than nine seconds. Uh, same here, it relies heavily on parallelism. Uh, and, um, and we can also, like another number that has been mentioned previously in the past, we can uh, Aggregates in less than two minutes uh, to the first, to the seventeen proof. Um, that's about it for the implementation uh, section, and I think we now we've set up some question and discussion items and topics. Uh, but we welcome any others. Um, so okay, can all... you just go back to that last um, uh, slide? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I didn't have time to look at it. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I think every, everything is uh, on the paper which is just published and we're going to share the URL also, I guess. Um, so 
uh, multiple topics, uh, but the trust itself, for example, uh, our main features, what the reason we chose this scheme and we adapted the scheme from Bunzenal was to rely the, uh, on the existing CRS. We didn't want to make our own. Um, this what we think maybe uh, it also cost us a little bit uh, more as uh, the scheme is slightly less, ex uh, more expensive uh, than the original one, uh, than then we can use directly. Uh, the library is also currently the as a fork and a very specialized in, uh, in all uh, very person framework. Uh, we could do this in a standalone library. Uh, compatibility issues, it's not compatible with R cross library currently because uh, the, the different scheme maybe we want that to uh, have two uh, libraries compatible. Um, can we extend this uh, general um, generalized inner pairing project agreement to over pairing based primitive. Uh, currently, we want to use it for growth system. Maybe there's over um, use cases and as well any effort of standardization here if uh, people are interested for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anka and Nicola. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, let's start by opening the floor. Are there any questions? Uh, haven't been maybe answered on the chat or, or something. I'll just add a small comment and like before I, I, I guess I let others say uh, questions. I like very much the fact that, you know, there is already an actual application. Uh, and, you know, this is extreme, extremely good motivation to, to see this uh, become a standard in my opinion. Uh, there was also a comment by by Deirdre here on you know how to com how, how does this compare you know between sort of recursive schemes for example that do this kind of batching as well right um, so it, maybe it's something to to discuss as well I think um, I, I think it's a, a little bit too early to tell my intuition is that um, hello two should be faster but uh, I, I don't quote me on that. My guess would be that Halo 2 will be much better on verifier time and proof size, but that this approach will be much better on prover time. So it depends what your priorities are, but that is without numbers, without implementations, without guesses. So it could be. Okay. Iran, would do you have, go for it? Uh, and also it will not have the disadvantage of having a bound of the number of proofs we, we can aggregate, even if this bound right now it's, it's big enough, but you know, it's always better to have uh, more possibilities. So, so I believe this does apply as well to all the other similar pairing based snacks, right? It's not just to go 16. I would assume that you can express the the verification equation or something. So you have, if you have an extra few elements, right? New few. Um, what is it? What is it? I'm thinking of. Is it growth model? Is it something that has uh, element B into groups like G1 and G2? So then, if you have this case, you could also do that. I guess. This is very symmetric equation. So how, yes, how general? I would guess that you could. I think also the question is. Is there a reason why people would want to? Yeah, all right. And, and I mean, it's interesting to apply this to Planck if you could. Oh, more than Planck. Harder, because you have a uh, random oracle query in the middle of the, the proof. Um, and that oh. basically means that if you're trying to do these algebraic tricks, they just fall apart. So can we characterize the class of applications where this is applicable? Uh, what needs to hold about the uh, instances being proven uh, for this to work? Uh, should I answer that one? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, the big thing is that you need to have a very algebraic structure in the statement that you're proving. 
So like with GROT16, because all of all that you're checking is pairing equations, it then becomes sort of possible to say, okay, let's check lots of these pairing equations at the same time and you can run these tricks. But if you're working with something which is sort of less algebraic, like if you're working with Shell, for example, then it's not obvious that the tricks would apply in the same way. So I, I maybe I understood wrong, but um, <clears throat> the question, but the way I interpreted it was more on the statement itself, like what kind of structure does need to be in the statement? Maybe I'm not sure if that was a, what the one meant or not, but uh, is there any specific structure that needs to exist in the statement or like, I'm sure there is just which one? The statement, I don't think so. Um, no. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. My impression was that it, it was generic to um, yeah. the statement for a given scheme. Okay, my bad. So maybe one important point to note is that all current implementation um, actually will use the same verification key and the same. Um, so so it needs to be the same statement, but they are in the original paper. Uh, we can actually aggregate uh, proof of different um, statements here. Uh, in our use cases, we start by the same uh, statement, so we. We focused really on that, um, but it's extendable. Yeah. So, so are you saying that um, it is extendable to the different um, verification keys? Just you haven't done that yet. Okay, that's correct. Yeah. Well, well, I, think, I think maybe a. Uh... Uh, I think maybe one natural extension uh, that is maybe not obvious, but, but maybe possible is uh, say you have a set of allowed verification keys, D1 to DK. Uh, can you do it where each proof has to be with one of them uh, and you don't know, that's all you know, you don't know which ones will be which. Uh, and you don't want to have to write down those, all those which key you used for each one. I've honestly never thought of that application. It sounds like a fun one. Yeah. Isn't that the, 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 the aggregator node should communicate that when it proves the aggregation? It, like at some point, it should be known. The proof should come. Well, it should, be known, it should be known to the aggregator. But I yes. guess one interesting question is if the it, it doesn't need to be known to the final verifier. Oh. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking of a use case specifically, Ayo? Uh Well, I mean, that's sort of uh, what uh, uh, happens in our uh, like ZK rollup uh, that, uh, yeah, there's basically three types of, of possible proofs. You're, you're rolling up, recursively rolling up snark proofs uh, and there's like a set of three allowed proof. There's something we call an account proof, something called a regular transaction, something we call a, an escape hatch. Uh, oh, sorry, no, uh, sorry, actually right now there's just two. Uh, and you're just, you're rolling up proofs and uh, so sort of the, the recursive statement. Okay, yeah, it's not exactly the same. Uh, um, yeah, so like we, uh, it's a, the recursive circuit is uh, checks that you're using one of uh, a, a predefined set of, of keys. That, that's like what happens in our, our uh, uh, ZK rollup. Uh, sorry, who asked the question though? Just for the next. Uh, yeah, that, that was me. No, no, you answered. But who was who asked the question? Oh, who, who asked? Okay, I thought the question that I asked. Uh, I think that that was Nicola uh, Gai, uh, who gave the talk. No, yeah, it was not really a question. It's just uh, an observation that currently our library does not extend to ver multiple verifying keys. And then how you reacted to this? Um, what do you mean by bandwidth complexity? 
Sorry, can everyone hear me now? Hello, hello. Now, yes. Okay, uh, cool. Uh, sorry, I, I had some issues with my with my hardware. So what I meant with uh, bandwidth complexity here is just that, of course, we're, we're focusing on, on blockchain systems, which is like the main application of ZK today, but like, like there, there are different use cases for, for zero knowledge. And, um, and what I was just trying to say is that like in the context where bandwidth complexity matters, like the number of messages exchanged and the size of these messages exchanged matters, then like recursing is nearly optimal, especially if you recurse using row 16, because you know the proof is actually fixed size. So like in this case, this is actually like pretty much optimal. So I was just trying to say that, of course, you're going to pay like an enormous price if you're willing to verify like n snarks within, you know, your if you're willing to implement n verifiers in your arithmetic circuit, but um, you're going to be saving on the number of bits you exchange and you write on the wire. So I'm just trying to expose the trade-offs here to make sure that um, I mean, we don't dive into biases, etc. Um, one one point here is that um, maybe it was not obvious from how we presented the scheme, but uh, the person who is aggregating the proof can be any third party, um, uh, which is uh, so in this specific case. I mean, for saving bandwidth, if, it, if it's outside the system, it can be any anybody, which is aggregating the proof. Um, but in the end, you still have a logarithmic uh, size proof here. Yeah. yeah, definitely. But, but I mean, I mean, this is great. I just wrote that in the chat because um, I mean, you, you win on the one hand, but you lose on the other. And that's just life. Everything is made of trade-offs. I was just keen to like uh, play the devil's advocate and write it in the chat, but absolutely. And if you want to verify and gross, it's in proofs inside a, inside a snark. Uh, I mean, this is going to be very expensive. We we know that the overhead is going to be massive. I'm just trying to say maybe in some contexts, like you may accept to just spend an hour computing the proof if it makes if it means that you're just going to exchange three group elements on the wire. But yeah, I, I mean, trade-offs. So I guess that might be sort of much more doable inside Halo because. Um, I think if you were trying to do it in GRUT16, you might actually run into an issue with your setup, like trying to do a setup, which is just big enough to um, encompass a statement that's large enough to cover aggregating two to the 17 proofs. I think that would be quite a quite a big ordeal. Um, you, you probably wouldn't want to do that in it, aggregate many proofs at once in Halo because um, the, it's linear. Um, you, you don't pay for the linear cost um, in the the um, uh, the verification checker in um, each step, but you do pay for it at the end. So, if there are no further questions about the power of the approach and applicability. Uh, let's talk about uh, where it fits in ZK proof uh, and our standardization oriented uh, approach. Uh, to state the obvious, we have not even standardized growth 16 in any uh, meaningful sense. Uh, so uh, this would be a more advanced form, but also clearly this uh, approach is very interesting for anyone who uses growth 16 uh, or could use it. Uh, this technique is uh, potentially uh, very attractive. So any thoughts about uh, what would be the best way to use the ZK Proof platform as a way to raise awareness for this? Um, so so there's, a, there's an intermediate step, which is just um, standardizing um, plain GROT16 uh, batch verification, which is already used in Zebra. Um, it's already deployed. Um, and that's much simpler. It's, it's described in um, Appendix B2 of the Zcash protocol spec. I mean, I think if all that came out of this is sort of some really concrete motivation for standardizing GROT16, that would be a pretty, pretty good result, as I'm concerned. Uh, I mean, in, in my bias, I would say that I, I would love to also see a kind of um, an outcome that goes into the zero knowledge, the ZK proof community reference, 
describing different types of, of batching and aggregation and things like this. Um, I think it would be super interesting because it lacks completely. I would like to add that but I think it would be interesting, although I still kind of, again, I don't really know what's the current state of the document with respect to have the secure definitions and description of uh, different types of, yeah, so basically aggregation to the recursion of Starks. So maybe these definitions would be something that is, uh, could, be, could be quite general to put in the reference document. I, I feel like the definition of like soundness after composition should be very different from the original soundness definition, right? Because you just basically take the same statement, but for, for basically you take the same, sorry, who's typing right there, sorry. Um, yeah. So you basically take take the same um, proof, but then you, you also need your uh, instances to be concatenated, something like that. So so what what's the, what's the security paradigm here? Is it like really very far from original growth 16? Anything to be said? I mean, the, the goal is to have the same security as if you were um, verifying all of the proofs separately. Um, so you don't want to trust the aggregator at all. Yeah. It seems straightforward to yeah, it's straightforward. make that into a security definition. It's not already in the paper. So this particular uh, version of, of recursion, I'd say, is probably a lot easier than other definitions because it's only one layer. Um, as in like, you can only do one proof of proofs. You can't do a proof of a proof of a proof of a proof. Um, when it comes to the standards documentation, do we have sort of a preference for what style of definition we would like to do in that sense? I'm going to take that as a no. Can you repeat the question? I, I didn't quite hear. Oh, sorry. Um, so what we have here is we're just doing one check that the verifier equations hold. So it's recursive, but it's only one layer of recursion. And what your a lot of other protocols are doing, like for example, your cycles of elliptic curves and your halo and that sort of thing, is they're doing a proof of a proof of a proof of a proof, etc. cetera, like many layers of recursion. And the two settings are sort of definitionally speaking, at least related, but different. Um, do we want to try and do a definition which encompasses both, encompasses both of them or do we want to keep them separate? I, I guess I don't know how different they are. Um, it, it depends how different. I mean, obviously, um, I have an incentive for us to um, standardize recursive stuff because that's what I spend my time on. Um, so that would be lovely, but I, I realize that it's complicated. So I only managed to find a very short paragraph on regards to composition that mentions uh, PCDs basically. And, and yeah, that's pretty much it. It's like four sentences. So um, I, I support that, right? I'm not sure how, how different the definitions would be. Uh, it seems like I would be pretty interested in having the recursive definitions somewhere because uh, my feeling is that they should be relatively general across different kind of solutions and across different regards solutions. So, so there's also the issue that um, uh, existing ways of instantiating recursion uh, have a kind of um, proof gap where you have to um, instantiate the, um, the random oracle. So you, you can't prove the whole protocol um, secure in the random oracle model directly. Um, I mean, I don't think that's the problem, but um, it's something that needs to be considered in the proof and the um, definitions. Turning back to standardization, I'd like to re-raise the question of um, actually including protocol specifications uh, under the ZK proof umbrella. Um, 
And uh, we have some protocols specs out there. I think the most impressive one is uh, the one by Zcash. Thank you, Dara, for your uh, tour de force in uh, I mean, writing and maintaining that protocol spec. Um, I apologize to the ones who I'm not thinking of right now. Um, and I wonder, should we start a process by which we include these in some form, whether by reference or by value, um, within the ZK-proof process and bless them as the ZK-proof standardization uh, specification of, say, ROS16 or Halo2 or whatever, and provide it with the test vectors and reference implementations and encourage practitioners to use that particular flavor and that particular bit representation in order to facilitate interoperability. And to stress, this form of bit by bit interoperability between implementations has been explicitly excluded from a scope in past workshops, but it feels like things are maturing and uh, maybe it's time to reconsider that. Thoughts? I, I mean, so playing devil's advocate, um, if you wanted to replicate sapling as, as um, other blockchains have, um, for example, Tezos has a version of sapling, um, why would you not just use the Zcash protocol spec? Why would you need an extra um, document that purports to standardize it? Because we're, we're, we're still fixing bugs in the spec. Um, I, I fixed one today. Um, what if it's not sapling that you're using, but you still want to use Grot 16? No, no, but the, the question that Aaron asked was, should we standardize um, protocols like Sapling? All right. Um, maybe there might be something to be said for, if not us standardizing, us at least sort of having some kind of guidelines on if you're going to do a protocol spec, this is what it should look like. Yeah, that, that would be fantastic. Because um, I, I mean, there are some things that we got right in that spec and some things that I would do differently if, um, well, some things that we are doing differently for Orchard. Um, so taking that knowledge and kind of trying to systemize it, uh, systematize it would be a good idea, I think. So to all the people on the call, uh, in, in consider the protocol that you are currently using uh, or considering using. Um, in what sense, if any, would it have been helpful if there were a specification of that blessed by the standardization efforts with reference implementation and test vectors, et cetera? Or conversely, are you happy just uh, having uh, a spec or code of your own and uh, interoperability has never been a big issue for you? I, I kind of want to let other people speak, although I have an answer. So I, I'm not sure. This seems like it would be expanding the scope of uh, the standardization effort a lot. So at, at this point, it's not just about standardizing ZK proofs, but about how to use them. And that's something which can be, you can make as arbitrary as you want. So I'm, I'm not sure if it, it makes sense to or let me phrase it differently. I think if we were to standardize these kind of specs, we'd have to be quite clear about what the limits are and what part is actually being standardized or being blessed by the ZK proof committee, because I, I don't... Question? Yeah, go ahead. My question is specifically about the, the, the low level ZKP scheme, not the application. So when I spoke of the ZK, ZK spec that was ambiguous, consider the growth 16 component mm. of that completely. Ah, okay, I misunderstood yeah, your question. Yes, that, that would be incredibly useful. We, we had to invent a bunch of things, formats and um, sort of generators for curves and uh, curves in some cases. Um, if we could have, we did reuse as much as we could um, and still had to um, roll a bunch of our own crypto. And if we had to roll less crypto, then that would be good. Yeah, and in that context, I agree. It makes perfect sense to point to existing well-documented specs for 
uh, for proof schemes? I, I mean, I would be completely happy to help with um, extracting things from the Zcash spec. I, I, that's what I tried to do um, with the um, ZK um, friendly primitives um, draft. Um, but it, it, it happens that the pandemic got in the way and no one works on it after I've done that. We this extraction would that. actually, sorry, go for it. Where? Oh, my comment is not like uh, important. I was basically saying that we definitely should have had a session where Dara tells us all how to write a critical spec. It would have been amazing. I'm happy to do that in the next workshop, where, whenever it is. Maybe we can uh, do it earlier than next workshop, but uh, we'll, we're, you know, taking, taking <laughs> notes. Uh... I can maybe do a ZK study <laughs> club on that or something. So I was going to say that this extraction actually of, of like cross 16 from the spec would be useful also for, for um, the like other, other working groups in ZK proof. Like we, we heard to this morning uh, or this earlier today, commit and proof that we want to do a growth 16 uh, sort of standardization form there. But um, by, by the way, Grot 16 isn't specified in full detail in the Zcash protocol spec, that we only specify how to do batch verification. And we only did that because it wasn't already in the Grot 16 paper. For, for the scheme itself, we just referenced the Grot 16 paper. So is the paper today the kind of the most up-to-date specification? I, I, I mean, so I'm not sure if you re-implemented from the paper whether you would end up with something that was interoperable. I, I think you probably wouldn't. And there are details of... Um, the, the, so for example, um, it's actually quite hard to standardize how you go from a high level circuit, so um, written to the Bellman API or written in um, some language like Leo or Zinc or whatever, to low level constraints. Um, and if you don't do that in a deterministic way, then you're not going to get interoperability. So you, you can still have interoperability between verifiers because that just needs a verification key. But in interoperability of provers, I don't see that happening between libraries um, anytime soon. I, that may be pessimistic, but it would require a lot of effort. So and just, even even between versions of a library is difficult. So, so, so just if I can also like play the David's advocate on this point with regard to the standardization of Gross 16, I think that would be amazing. Um, uh, but like there are also some small fl different flavors of Gross 16, like they, they, depending on on what is your end use case. This is also why I'm trying to. I mean, we, like blockchain is one use case and I have skin in the game myself. I'm, I'm working for a, a, a company in this field, but there are other, other projects. And for instance, if we, you want to use Gross 16 on Ethereum, you don't have like the appropriate primitives to manipulate groups, uh, uh, elements of the target group. And so you need to do some, some small modifications to make sure that you're only manipulating group uh, like uh, um, uh, source group elements uh, at the cost of doing some extra pairings. And so um, it's also kind of interesting to know these small details to make sure that if we are, if we are going to standardize Gross 16, we standardize a version that makes most sense for most people, maybe beyond even blockchain applications. So uh, what are the verification key going to look, what is the verification key going to look like, et cetera? Do we want to make these small modifications? Uh, I don't know, but I think this is important to make sure that the different flavors because we are, we all have different projects and we all operate under different set of constraints so it's kind of it's kind of interesting in my opinion for this movement to have an impact for the standardization to have an impact to make sure that we try and be aware of the potential biases of people and and really focus on what makes sense for the maximum amount of people rather than trying to favor like to favor one or two projects I think it will make a lot of sense to start uh, in, in a fort in this direction. And uh, we already have uh, three milestones, the basic growth 16 battery verification, and then uh, the work we've just seen. Um, what uh, what beside growth 16? 
what other, in particular, what other uh, useful precise specs do we have out there for ZKP schemes or large fragments thereof that uh, would be easily matured into start, such a standardization effort for concrete schemes? So j just going back to the talk that was given, the, like the great talk, um, like if, even if we if we want to go beyond vanilla growth and and want to focus on aggregation, etc., there are like a few obvious things that are that, that would be relevant to standardize. I.e., how do we sample the random element to do the random uh, like uh, linear combinations of the elements? Like, of course, the obvious way. I mean, you have different ways to do it if you just look at the theory, right? You can just sample n elements like differently, but this is very inefficient. You may want to sample only one and exponentiate it. Uh, and so all these small details again can, uh, you know, be some somehow um, uh, can benefit from this standardization movement, I, I believe. And so uh, we can go layer by layer. I mean, I don't. There are like plenty of other things, plenty of other proof systems, plenty of other methods. But at least trying to focus on these small details, which are making inter interoperability annoying, is kind of important. And also, if we consider security, because again, if we when we start to do this type of aggregations. I mean, we are affecting the overall security of the system because, of course, it doesn't reduce directly to, this, to the soundness of the underlying system. But now you also have like the probability is that you have some, some checks that cancel with one another, et cetera. Because like each proof verification kind of happens in one dimension in a vector space and you collapse everything into one dimension using this, this linear combination. So all of this is going to have an impact on the, um, on, the, on the security. And again, having like the standardization effort coming and stamping it and saying, well, this is a way we, we need to sample from this type of, of, of sets, et cetera, would make sense in my opinion. Yeah, you, you actually have to have a lot of domain knowledge to come up with these things yourself. And it, implementing from a paper usually doesn't give you enough detail. Um, the, you have to understand the underlying math in order to, to pick various um implementation choices um so it's it's almost easier to standardize from uh, some library that implements the scheme and try to be interoperable with that rather than being interoperable with a paper the, the latter doesn't really make sense i mean it, it could make sense if papers were as precise as a protocol spec but they aren't for page length and other reasons So, okay, so we have like a, a couple of minutes or three minutes left of discussion. Um, <clears throat> I, would, I would like to ask, I think it's obvious from the past conversation, but should we create a Telegram group focused on sort of establishing at least an initial uh, you know, standard or focus on Growth16 plus some kind of batching or aggregation? Okay, maybe let's do the chat answers. That way, you know, uh, more than two people will raise their hand. Uh, okay, if you if you think we should, then please say yes in the chat. Okay. So the alternative to this is having the forum discussion. Right, which is slightly uh, more asynchronous. Uh, you mean the, zero, the ZK proof reference document? Yeah, in, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. For, for any kind of discussion, the other alternative other than using Telegram chat would be using for right, which is slower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, let, let, let me make something Makes clear. Sense, Maybe yeah. I didn't say it before, but last year, as I said earlier, <laughs> the work, we've, uh, we're trying to do experiments all the time. Wait one second. Uh, there I'm muting you, so uh, your mic. Um, we this is this is all experiments, right? Like this is the second time we actually do this kind of working group creation from proposals. Last year we did it through the forum, and it didn't kind of work. So yeah. of course there are many variables to to account, but one thing we saw is that there is no traction. People are not engaged. The groups are difficult to find and to join, and messages are not fully public. I mean it's a kind of a mess, right? That, so we, we went from kind of one extreme to the other. Okay, what's the easiest thing that we know people use? Telegram. Let's get you know these these groups going on yeah. Telegram. Because actually, the only three groups that had a Telegram group for whatever reason 
actually generated some conversation and some documents. So um, I don't want to think about the forum as the place of working group, uh, sort of uh, the base for working groups anymore. Maybe email will be the next step. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't think we've thought enough about this. And and and, and I also want to give some. We want to give some freedom to the working groups to decide. Um, and actually, I'll talk about this in a few minutes as well uh, in this closing ceremony kind of thing. But um, I also will say on that comment, uh, Michael, that um, having a, a, com a content, you know, contributed to the zk proof community reference is not uh, mutually exclusive from having a working group on the opposite right we would like if there is a working group that working group ideally could also generate some content that would be used as kind of this reference that is also separate from the standard right like the two can ex coexist um so yeah okay that, I, don't generally, I don't generally support i think it's kind of cool yeah uh, especially because of the kind of synchronous aspects i think it should um raise the level of engagement uh subjectively as feel so so yeah okay telegram groups good um okay good so so um i may ask the authors to go ahead and create this telegram group um and uh again i i, I think we should have you know follow-up called in the next couple or three months so that we we keep engaging engagement um any many any maybe closing comments around this this proposal okay so thank you again to anka and to nicola for, for presenting and of course mary as, as the third author of the proposal um thanks to Iran for moderating and everybody for participating this was really interesting um unfortunately we got to the end of this sessions of the workshop i'm going to i'm going to stop recording and start again